Hey guys, welcome back to We Met at Acme. I am so excited to be back with my friend Sarah Levy, the now author of Drinking Games. I'm so happy to be back. I'm so, so good happy. to see you. It's so great to have you back in the city. Yeah. So for a refresher for anyone who didn't listen to our first episode, which I don't know why they wouldn't have, but yeah, they should listen. They should. How old are you and where are you from? I'm 33. I'm from New York originally and I live in Los Angeles. Love it. And what is your current relationship status? Because that has changed that since has we recorded. Changed. I am married. Amazing. Amazing. And for some background, um, Sarah and I met three, four years ago now? Yeah, like which, four years ago. Yeah, four years ago um, through being sober. Yeah. And, um, and just so happened that I think it was like, I don't know, maybe like the fifth time we hung out, the fourth time we hung out, we we're talking about dating. Cause obviously I'm always talking about that. Yeah. And I was like, Oh my God, you need to meet this guy. He'd be perfect for you. But he lives in LA Yeah, and introduce you. And now you guys are married. I know it's, so it's crazy. such a good story. And every time I tell it, it's like so unbelievable to me that it worked out. It's unbelievable. And it really, I'm, I have to credit the like I have to credit astrology in this right. case because I was like, you're a Virgo yes, and he's a cancer. Like your grandparents. Like my grandparents. Yeah. <laughs> That's literally all I knew. Like yeah. I was like, perfect. Done. I know. I love that. And I remember, I mean, I remember like our first conversations, you have such a way of just making someone feel comfortable. And I remember very early on, I just felt like I could trust you. You were just very like easy to talk to. And you're like, so what's the deal? Like, are you single? And I just trusted you. You know, you're like, I know this nice guy and I feel like you guys would hit it off. And in retrospect, like he was a total stranger who lived across the country. And totally. I was like, yeah, give him my number. I love it. But also like there was so much that weirdly was like aligned with you guys. Yes. And I feel like you had manifested each other in so many ways. Like I think he had literally said to me that like he wants like a French girl who went to Brown. That's like, so funny. <laughs> that's literally that's you. Me. Yeah. <laughs> it's so crazy. I do think I manifested him. And I literally, I remember like writing a list of like the qualities that I wanted in a partner, you know, and some of them were like a lot of people could have them like nice and yeah. smart and supportive. But also I loved that he was, you know, independent. He has his own business. He was just very driven, funny, you know, kind. Yeah. And and we had so many of the same values. We loved to travel, like things you couldn't have known. Right. Like on the surface, it was just like, yeah, two like Jews from New York. Right. Like maybe you guys would have things to talk about, but it was so, we had this like instant connection. Yeah, it's amazing. And we talk about it all the time. We're like, Lindsay changed our lives. <laughs> I love like it. Like every time we tell the story. Going back now to that like beginning phase of your relationship, what yeah. were some green flags for like people listening that are, you know, starting to see someone new? I felt so comfortable with him right off the bat. You know, it sounds cheesy when people are like, it felt like going home or it felt like being home, but it did. I just felt like I could really talk to him and he listened to me and he remembered things I said and um, asked questions and, you know, just made me feel really special. Not in like a creepy, like love bombing way, just yeah. like he like saw me, you mm -hmm. know, he was just like, it's really cool that you're, you know, at the time I was like a year and a half sober and I was like thinking I might, I was still working in marketing, but I was like, I think I might want to, you know, pursue writing full time. And he was just like, do it. Like he thought it was so cool. And, um, he just had this really, like he had a mindset of like abundance, you know, which is something yeah. I've talked about. Like he was just like, yeah, anything's possible. And he talked, and we just talked about the dreams that we both had. And it was just really easy to picture like doing a lot of those things with him. Totally. Um, other green flags. I mean, he just like texted and called when he said he right. would and like always made plans and made, you know, came up with fun ideas for future dates. And he was just excited about like continuing to see me. And um, I just liked him. I just, yeah. it was just like a feeling in my gut. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. It really is a feeling. And now you guys are married, you live in LA, you yep. moved. Yep. to LA. I did. Um, how did the decision of who's going to move for who come up? Like, how did you know what was yeah. going to be the end result there? It's so funny. I remember when we first started talking, my friends being like, well, you're not going to move to LA. Right. And I was like, I would never, like, I love New York. I'll never leave. Um, my family's here. Like all my friends are here. And at the time, Adam was back and forth for work. So he had clients in LA and clients in New York. And so we kind of were back and forth for a little while. And 
I remember saying to him, like, I, I don't see myself leaving New York. And it's just so funny how like your mindset can really shift. We were together for about a year and then we started talking about spending more time in LA. And by then I was full time working you know, for myself. I was freelance, I was doing some consulting. So I had the flexibility to do that. And we spent a month in LA and I really liked it. And it was just yeah. sort of a moment where I was like, maybe, like maybe I could be open to this. And he had also been the one up until that point in the relationship who was really bending over backwards to make it work. Like he was the one flying, you know, at least once a month coming to New York, like really showing me that he was committed to not just being like pen pals, like he sure. wanted to be yeah. in a relationship. And so I remember talking to our friend, Brittany, she was like, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for you to like, compromise a little bit and just see see how it goes. And if you hate it, come back to New York. And so we kind of had made the decision that we would, we were open to to moving to LA. And then COVID happened. Like mm -hmm. a month later, we went into lockdown and we quarantined in New York together for like three or four months. And at that point I was like, you know, so many people were leaving and it, it made it easier for me to, right. to think about actually leaving and, and trying something new. And so we moved June, 2020. Wow. Yeah. And got a dog. We got a dog. Which is really cute. Yeah. What other than getting a dog did you do for yourself once you moved there to feel like you had your own, you know, I mean, obviously that the dog is a joint thing, but like, did you feel like you had enough close friends there? Did mm -hmm. you feel like you, like, how did you make yourself continue to be independent in your relationship when he had his own thing set up there already? Such a good question. And that was such a priority of mine. Like what I loved about my life in New York was I was so independent. I had so many friends and I just had, I could do something every single night of the week without needing to even like talk to him, you know? Right. We had to like plan date nights. It wasn't just like assumed that we were hanging out. And then we moved to LA where I basically knew no one. I mean, I had a few friends of friends and Adam had friends who were lovely and kind, but like I didn't have my people and I was really freaked out. I was like, I don't want to put a strain on our relationship. I don't want to be too dependent on him. I also like I had a driver's license, but I wasn't a confident driver. Yeah. And so the first couple months I felt like I had to like ask him, like my parents, like pick me up and drop me off places. Yeah. Granted, it was like quarantine. So there wasn't a lot to do or a lot of places to go, but I, I felt like so dependent on him and I hated it. And so I really made it a priority to just do things on my own. I did a lot of like, it felt like dating, like coffee dates with friends of friends and just trying to like go on walks with people, get coffees with people. Um, you know, and being a writer, I don't have like coworkers or an office to go to. And again, it was 2020, so no one really had that, which helped a little bit because I didn't feel like, oh, everyone else is hanging out without me. Like right. people had flexible schedules. I made a friend where we would like just go on hikes, on, you know, on random times during the week together. And that was nice. But I definitely made an effort to find my own people and do things without Adam, I think it's really important in any relationship to have your own lives and to be like yeah. two individuals coming together. So um, important. Otherwise it's like, what do you have to talk about? You know? Right. And um, so that was something I, I really prioritized was like finding people, finding a community of my own and really making sure that I was like putting my sobriety first, my self care first, like just doing the things that I needed to, to do to continue to show up as the person that, I want to be in that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've now been sober, sober. Is it five years now? Yeah. Cause I have four years. Yeah. Crazy. It's crazy. Crazy. Also because when I first got sober, I remember you had like a year or maybe almost a year and I was like, that's the longest time I've ever heard of I anyone know. being sober. And now I'm like, that's nothing. Yeah. Um, planning your wedding, having a sober wedding. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you? We, I did a, an episode on sobriety, mm -hmm. um, you know, a few weeks, four months ago, we'll see when this comes out. And um, I talked about my sober wedding and just, you know, how it was like, I could not even fathom having drink at this wedding because it went by so quickly, even as someone who was sober. Mm -hmm. So what was that experience like for you? Same, I mean, before getting sober, the two things that like I had in my head were, how would I ever get married without drinking? And like, what will I do on my honeymoon? And like, I didn't have a boyfriend. There was no honeymoon or wedding <laughs> yeah. happening, but like those were the two big events that I couldn't imagine doing without drinking. And then they happened and I'm so grateful that I was sober for them because like you said, they, my wedding day went by so fast. I was present for all of it. And I was, it was 
exhausting. Like I, it was so much adrenaline. Like all I wanted was water and food. Like if I had been drinking on top of having an empty stomach or just like the jitters from the day, like I definitely would have blacked out. Yeah. I'm sure that I would have thrown up by the end of the night. Like it wouldn't have been cute. I would have woken up the next day with a horrible headache. And instead I really got to just be so present for that moment and enjoy the day. Um, I didn't even think about drinking. Like I, I truly didn't. And yeah. it's wild to think about that now because five years ago, that was something where I was just like, well, we'll see. Like maybe I'll drink when that day comes. Right. Cause I, I really just couldn't imagine it without at least like a glass of champagne. Did you do anything like simulating a toast type of thing? Yeah, so we had, you know, a full bar for all the guests who were drinking. And then we also had like a signature mocktail mm -hmm. and um, like sparkling cider for guests who weren't drinking. What was your signature mocktail? It was like nothing crazy. I think it was like, oh my God, I don't even remember now. Like, um, wait, oh, I remember now. It was like a blackberry, like lemonade Yum. with um, sparkling water. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember same thoughts. And then I also like, we did our honeymoon in Anguilla. Where yeah. did you guys go again? Hawaii. Amazing. Yeah. And I remember thinking like Anguilla is like this like island and like they like make these beautiful drinks and like pina coladas and the, and first of all, a non-alcoholic pina colada is unbelievable. Delicious. Unbelievable. My favorite thing. Like literally I way know. better than a regular, like Stephen was like, this is so much better than a regular pina colada. He was like, I'm only getting these pina it's coladas from now on. It's my favorite thing. I know. Like what Creamy, is the name for it? Why delicious. am I, it's not called a non-alcoholic. It's called a. Like a virgin. A virgin, yeah. a virgin pina colada. Virgin I'm like, pina colada. I forgot the name it's for virgin. so good. So good. Like yeah. all of those drinks, virgin are amazing. It's like like especially calories without the incredible. alcohol. It's so incredible. good. And like being on my honeymoon, right? Like I, when I used to drink and like would drink on vacations, like I would get such a headache by yeah. like before dinner time because I would be drinking on the beach. Right, because it was like a nonstop thing non -stop. on vacation. Instead, I was like fresh. Totally. Yeah. Sometimes really I good. would like miss like the night. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It's. It was bad. So you and Adam are both like entrepreneurs, which yes. is amazing. Um, similar to Stephen and I actually. Yes. I'm curious because I get this question all the time. What do you do in terms of finances? Mm. So like for us, like I think it's so important that even though maybe we have one like joint account mm -hmm. that we still have our own accounts, like yep. for things that are just for us or whatever. Like how yes. do you make those decisions? Great question. And something that I feel like everyone should talk about if they're living with a partner or engaged or whatever. Yeah. Um, we do the same thing. So we have a shared account, a joint account, which we started right before we got married, like when we started getting gifts. Mm -hmm. And um, and then like after the wedding, like that was where we would put like the gifts that we got right. for, for our wedding. Um, and we both like put money into it kind of like based on, we have like a little system based on who's making more money. Mm -hmm. So it's like based on a percentage. Um, and then we have our own accounts as well. And I guess we both have our business accounts also. So mm -hmm. there's like more accounts, but if you think of it like three, it's like I have my account, right, we have right. a joint account, he has his money. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's really important to have your own money and to feel independent that way. I mean, when you're married, like marriage is a contract, like everything that's mine is his and everything right. that's his is mine, like it's all the same. But I do think that there's something just psychologically very empowering as a woman or even maybe just speak for myself, like for me, I love knowing that I'm able to buy something if I wanted and, you know, get a gift or just have financial freedom in that way. Yeah. Yeah. What would you do? Like, let's say you were like a stay at home mom, like how would you create that financial freedom if you didn't have your own income stream? Like, yeah, I think that being a stay at home mom is also a job. Like it's a full-time job and think that that's like conversations to have with your partner around like, okay. Like pay me. Like pay I'm, me. I'm yeah. doing this job. Or like, I don't want to hear about it. Yeah. Like this is our money. Mm -hmm. And if I wasn't at home, I would be out working and bringing in money doing X, Y, Z. But instead like I am holding it down right, here like and we've raising your kid. Like we've, we've agreed to this arrangement. Therefore, I'm going to spend our money the same way that I would spend my own. Right. Um, and obviously like everyone's situation is different. So having like mutual respect and talking about a budget and like what that looks like. But I do think once that conversation has been had, feeling empowered to spend money 
on the things that are important to you within reason is really important, you know, mm-hmm. versus feeling like you need to ask permission. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the notion? Because I've heard this recently with some couples that I know where like if both of them work, mm-hmm. all of the man's money goes to like things for the couple and like renovations and kids schooling and um you know, dinners that they take Mm -hmm. out, but like all the woman's money goes to like her personal shopping stuff. Like, do you think that's fair? No. Yeah. I don't think that's fair. If that's, and we can add groceries. Yeah. And that's something that works out Uh for you guys. That's great. But I feel like, no, it's a partnership. So both partners should be contributing to shared expenses. Right. And I mean, it's interesting in my relationship, Adam also like loves clothes and loves shopping. So yeah. he'll be on Mr. Porter like shopping no. for himself. And I'm like, wait, like, should I be shopping more? Like, uh-huh. so I think it, I think it's also just like dependent on who wants to spend money on that stuff. Right. right? Like it could be that the guy wants to spend money on yeah. clothes or whatever. Um, but I think it also changes, right? Like with where you're at in your relationship, like our first year married, like we were, we traveled a good amount. We would eat out. Like we weren't necessarily thinking about like finances in the same way that maybe now we are starting mm-hmm. to think about like our future. Um, so I feel like it's a good idea to have like financial check-in conversations. Be yeah. Like where are we at? How are we feeling about what we've been spending our money on? Like, you know, I think it can feel very daunting and overwhelming. And I have experienced this where I'm like, I wish that we had been taught this stuff in school. Right. Like when to start saving and how much to save every month. And who puts how much into our shared account. Um, And I think it's just like having conversations and talking to your friends about it also and being like, what do you guys do? What works for you? Yeah. Who pays when you get your nails done? Like, how does it work? People don't talk about it. They don't. And it's so crazy that we weren't taught it in school. Like it is one of the most, like I'm never doing math ever. Right. But I am always needing to know yeah. about how to work my finances totally. and like how to pay taxes. And yeah, I just have zero knowledge because it was never taught to me. And like now I have to learn. Yeah. It's so frustrating. Um, but speaking of future conversations have. So how does being sober affect your thoughts on kids and like how you will raise them and kind of like are you going to want them to drink or not Mm. to drink? You know, like, have you thought about that that far out, even though you're not supposed to future trip? You know, what's so funny is like, I remember thinking before I got sober, like, oh, like I can't get sober because one day I'll have a kid and they'll think it's really weird that I don't drink. I think that too. And it's like, what? Like what kid? Like how am I showing up as a mom if I'm like, drunk, you know? And that's just how I drank was like, if I was still drinking and I had a baby, like that wouldn't be cute. Like I wouldn't be able to like show up and, you know, be the kind of mom that right. I would want But at be. the same time, like how do you explain to a kid why right. mommy's not drinking? Why mommy's not drinking. Like mommy can't have that special juice. You know, I have thought a little bit about it only in the sense that I think it's going to be great to be a sober parent. You know, I have friends who have kids and some of them are sober and some of them are not. And the ones that are not have always said like, oh, it's going to be so great to not have to parent with a hangover. Like they're like the hardest thing about having a kid is sometimes like those nights that you go out and like have a couple of drinks, nothing crazy. And then the baby still wakes up at four or five o'clock in the morning and like yeah. you still have to get up and be a parent. You right. know? Um, so in that sense, I think it'll be great to not be, you know, dealing with a headache when I'm hopefully a mom. Um, but you know, one of my favorite things about being sober has been like reconnecting with my inner child and like my most authentic self. I think that's something I really couldn't do when I was drinking because I was so concerned with like, what did everyone else think? And what was everyone else doing? And how can I fit in? And what do I wear? And what do I say? And now like the last five years have been this cool and ongoing have been this really cool process of becoming who I really am. And and just feeling comfortable in my own skin. And a lot of that is like just fun stuff, like innocent stuff. And I am really excited to sort of get to reparent myself in some ways and like show up as a mom and create like traditions around holidays and just like wholesome things that I kind of moved away from when I was so concerned with like partying and what other people are doing. So I'm excited for that. That is really exciting. In terms of like 
having a teenager and if they'll drink, yeah, I'm sure that they will. And I think. Like, do you tell them that they're like predisposed? That's such a good question. Like, cause I'm like, I don't know what I like. Cause for me, like no one in my family is like, you know, is struggles with aware drinking. that yeah. they're an alcoholic right. except for me. Okay. So I'm like, do I, so it, it, yes, mm. it's potential genetics, you know, but at the same time it could not be. So it's like, do I say, be careful when you're drinking because you might really like it or yeah. don't smoke too much weed or like, do I just say like, do you, but then if you have questions about doing it too much, you know, I'm around. That's such a good question. I think that, like I saw a TikTok LOL recently about this mom who was like, I have a no questions asked policy with my kids wherever they are, no matter what time it is, they're not going to get in trouble. They call me, I'm there, I pick them up. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that to a certain extent, I would like to bring into my future parenting style. Um, just like, yeah, you're going to do what you're going to do. You're going to be curious. I personally feel like having a um, a mindset of like shame or secrecy around drinking can sort of feed the beast because then it's mm. like, oh, I have to do this in secret and I don't know how much I should drink. So maybe I'll drink more because I don't know if there'll be any leftover later and I don't want to get in trouble, right? It's just like this, that was sort of my experience in, in high school was like, I knew it was bad and I shouldn't be drinking. And so I didn't really like learn how to do it right. ever. I feel um, like that's many, many people's experience. Too. Yeah. And so I don't think I'll teach my kids like, this is what a shot is. But I think just being like, if you're curious, if you're drinking, please don't drive, call me, whatever, that. Okay, so there's that. And then I think with like being predisposed to like addiction or alcoholism or what have you, you know, I don't have a lot of alcoholism in my immediate family, but I definitely, now that I'm sober, I'm getting like glimpses of you know, oh, right, that like great aunt probably had a problem or like, oh yeah, we didn't talk about it at the time. But like, I think this person maybe had something or had some, was predisposed to depression. And I'm like, oh, that actually makes me feel so much less alone and a right. little bit less like it's, you know, just like a me thing. Yeah. Um, And it's like, you know, I have a family history of breast cancer, for example. And it's cool that I know that because I can take certain actions now to like start getting mammograms, mm -hmm. right? Like before I'm 35 or just like be aware of it instead of feeling like a sitting duck. So I think in that sense, having conversations one day with our kids about like, this was mom's experience. Right. It might not be yours, but if you have questions or if you want to talk about it, I feel like that's all that you can really do. Totally. Um, and also I think it was, um, Glennon Doyle in her book. Did you read Untamed? I like I've been in it. It's so good. Not, she not has this one line where she's like, you know, your kids are not um, clay that you can like mold or mess up. Like they come out and they're already people like they're 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 who they're going to be more or less. All you really need to do is like love them and, and kind of like teach them yeah. right from wrong. And so it's also like that takes some of the pressure off, I think, of like if my kid's going to like drinking, like that's going to be what it's going to be. But I have an opportunity to answer their questions and be an example of like, hopefully this is what it looks like to continue to not drink um, and sort of help like shed some of the, the stigma around it. That's amazing. I yeah. like that a lot. I think that there's this weird like misconception or belief among like normal quote unquote social media users that oversharing is like cringe. Yeah or not even oversharing, just like sharing super openly on social media. It's like, oh, you're trying to be an influencer or like you're mm. trying really hard. And it's like, when I started sharing about being sober, I was, I was writing for different publications, but I was also posting on Instagram about it. And I remember having some people say to me like, are you sure you wanna be like posting about this? Like, it's so vulnerable or like, what are people gonna you know think? Or it feels like, maybe this would just be a private better to, to be had as like a private conversation. And at the time, like I, I don't have a huge following still. And definitely then I didn't have anyone other than like my friends and family following me. And I remember being like, no, I I'm going to post about this yeah. because this is what's actually going on for me. And I would have loved to 
see this from someone else when I was struggling because right. it would have made me feel so much less alone. Totally. And I totally agree with you. I think that like a lot of normal, you know, social media people who are just on social media, whatever you want to call them, non-influencers still like post the highlight reel because mm -hmm. it's like, that's just what is, I don't know, like acceptable. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. And that when you share more about maybe something hard that's going on for you, it's seen as like trying to do something, trying. Yeah, we that's talked, so we've sad, talked about this but before. yeah, you're like, right. It's like, why are you oversharing? Like, are you trying to get likes? Are you trying to get right, followers? Are you right. trying to elicit some sort of a reaction? And it's like, maybe sometimes people aren't genuine, but in my experience, like I have had very positive experiences sharing in real time about things I've had yeah, going on. Me too. Because it's let me connect with people and, and felt less alone. And also like, it's a great way to get resources. Yeah, you know, it's like, it's I don't true. know what I don't know. And so I think sometimes like being open about what you have going on is a really good way to connect with someone who might be like, not like giving unhelpful advice, like, oh, relax. You know, mm -hmm. they might be like, I don't know, read this book or. Yeah. Speaking of read this book. Speaking of Let's books. round out. Tell us about drinking games. Is it your life story? And if it is, how and like, will the people reach out to you who you definitely oh talked God. about, but change their name? Okay, so let's talk about drinking games. So I always wanted to write a book. That was like my dream. You know, it's like kids want to be pop stars. They want to be ballerinas. Like I always wanted to be an author. I love books. I've always like, anytime I have something that I don't quite understand or know how to work through, like I look for a book on it or even just like for fun, like on vacation, like I'm reading, I love books. And so and it's funny now, and we're just talking about social media, like I've had a couple of people, like friends slash like, are we, are they my friends that are like, well, who's gonna buy this? Like so many people talk about so, um, sobriety on social media now, like do we really need a book on it? And I'm like, Ew, yes, what? like people want books. Like people yeah. like to read, like books will always yeah, be in. Yeah, I'm like, reading every night. I love books. So I always wanted to write. And when I got sober, I started journaling a lot. And just writing about like all the firsts and just a lot of the feelings and was freelancing and, you know, wrote for The Cut, wrote for The New York Times um, and had been getting a really positive response. And a lot, I had read a lot of like addiction memoirs and oftentimes like they, they end when the person gets sober, like they hit bottom, they have all these crazy stories and then they see the light and they get sober at the end. And I always wondered about like what happens after, like what happens when you're going on your first date and you're not drinking. What happens when you tell your friends? Like, how does everything change? Mm. I didn't want anything to change when I got sober, but like it does and yeah. in a lot of really cool ways. So that was sort of the idea for the book. And I wrote it and it is a memoir um, in essays. And so it's different subjects and how they were impacted by my drinking and then by my decision to get sober. So everything from like my dating life, my career, my mental health, wellness, social media. Um, and I'm so, I'm so excited that I get to share it soon. And it's so good. What is your favorite chapter? Oh, I love that question. Um, I love so many of them. Um, there's one about, I have like a few that I love. There's one about manifestation and like the yeah. power of manifesting that I love. And it's not like woo woo manifestation. Mm -hmm. It's just about like taking ownership over your life and your decisions right. and how it's impacted me. That one always like makes me emotional when I read it. Um, there's one about startup culture, which is like close to my heart. Mm. Um, and I love, there's one called alcoholism needs a makeover that I love. And I think is hopefully going to be an important conversation starter around this idea of like the stigma that still exists around sobriety and right. how like we've made so many strides in the way that we talk about mental health and the way we talk about, you know, sexual assault. And I think sobriety still has a stigma of like, ooh, you must have been like a really bad alcoholic to need to get sober or you must have lost everything. And I think we still have work to do around just right, collectively breaking that. That's neither of our stories. No. And yeah, I mean, if you're looking for a book if you're sober curious or sober or not even close to ever getting sober one day but just want to read an amazing book like this is that book truly i have to ask there was a chapter called how i was influenced by an influencer yeah it was it a real influencer it was oh my god i want to know <laughs> 
you, we can talk about it off air. <laughs> okay. Um, um, but to your earlier question, names were changed mm -hmm. to protect the privacy of those mentioned in the book, uh -huh. and um, and some identifying details were were changed. Um, and but you know, it's it's not like a how to self help book. It's right. a book about my experiences, and so I had to write a book that was true. And some people people were part of that. Yeah. Fuck you, exes. <laughs> <laughs> um, amazing. Can you leave us with a quote or piece of advice, maybe something from the book that you can share with our mm. listeners? You know, I think that before I got sober, I had a certain idea of the things that I wanted from my life. Like I thought I wanted to hook up with this guy or get this promotion. And the coolest thing about getting sober has been like, this life beyond my wildest dreams that like I never even imagined some of the things that have happened for me now. And so I guess the, the piece of advice is like, you don't know all the ways in which your life could change if you just gave up that one thing. It could be alcohol, it could be pot, it could be like anything that's not serving you, but like dare to believe that your life could just get so much better. I have can. full body chills from that. Where can everyone find you and order the book? You can find me on Instagram at Sarah L. Levy and the book comes out January 3rd and you can buy it wherever books are sold. And there's more info on my website, sarahllevy.com. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks.